Hello and welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe podcast. Today we are continuing on our path to Kenobi as myself, Matthew Fox, am joined by Matthew Carroll and we're talking about the character of Kenobi, primarily in the TV show The Clone Wars. Uh, Matt Carroll is watching it for the first time, he and I are talking about it, and just kind of getting more and more excited. May 25th is coming. All that more after a commercial break, we have no control over Welcome back. I'm Matthew, your host. I'm joined, as I said, by Matthew Carroll. Uh, Mr. Carroll, how are we doing today? Man, you know, pretty good. Recording some Orville this morning, now recording some Star Wars content. I, mm-hmm. you know, I've been watching season two of Clone Wars. Let's uh, let's dive yeah. in. I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm finally getting into the meat, uh, I feel like, of some of this stuff. And it excites me because I just, I guess I'll get into it. Sp- Season two, I think, was much better than season one. Yeah. Like the episodes I was watched from season two were, I don't know, it a hundred percent better than season one episodes. Yeah, and so just for some context, for those who are tuning in, you know, Matt Carroll is very much a Star Trek guy. Uh, he runs the Star Trek Universe podcast that the Star Wars Universe podcast is kind of modeled on in some ways. And we've had kind of a running back and forth about, you know. Does Star Wars have some of the depth of Star Trek and stuff like that? Or is it all just spaceships and laser swords and the like? And I remember, like, I I wanted you to kind of watch some stuff. And so you were super excited about it. We were both super excited to have you dive in. And season one of Clone Wars is is a rough start, to be sure. So I'm glad that... And and just to let people know, what, what Matt's been doing is watching the episodes that are particularly relevant for Kenobi. So in this case, we're watching the Duchess of Satine plot. Uh, that's kind of, I think, the main meat of, of this season. But Duchess of Mandalore well. or whatever. Yeah, Duchess of Mandalore and all that kind of stuff. So um, if you want more in-depth about those episodes, of course, you can feel free to... If you want more in-depth about those episodes, check out earlier episodes of this show where we did a episode-by-episode coverage of those. But especially if you're kind of getting ready for Kenobi, this is this is really kind of the heart and soul of one of the biggest parts of his character is where we learn that he had this person in his life, Duchess Satine, uh, uh, who at one point he had very strong feelings for, and as he said, might have even left the uh, Jedi Order for. So yeah, so what what do you? Uh, I mean, I'll back up a second. I want to dive into the Kenobi of it specifically, but in general, like, what do you like about these episodes? Well, I guess I'm always interested in watching the evolution of the Obi Wan and Anakin relationship, and clearly, watching Obi Wan have this relationship with Satine informs the relationship with Anakin and Padme later, you know? Yeah. Um, and so clearly there's a lot going on there. And, you know, a lot of the things they, they, they played with this in season one, the episodes I've seen as well, where they like toy with this idea that Anakin is brash and like always going to go in to fight. And Obi-Wan's always sort of trying to rein him in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, not trying hard enough, I would say, like, because <laughs> yeah. he constantly breaks, you know, he constantly disobeys orders and then just get he he wins. So then he gets away with it. You know, it's almost yeah. like watching it's watching a parent constantly never tell their kid no. And then eventually they turn out to be an asshole like that's yeah. that's Darth Vader, uh, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he's been like led into the the force by this guy who just never really told him no. He told him no and just never, never set actual boundaries on this kid. And he keeps right. going and going and going and, you know, evil, evil yeah. warlord later. <laughs> you get evil. I, I tell you, this is how you get evil warlords. This is yeah. how we get ants. And I think it's such a good. It's such an interesting part of the character is just on its own. But as we get ready for the Kenobi show, it is particularly interesting to me because and I don't know, but from other media that's about sort of Obi-Wan during this time and even what he says in the the original movies, you get the sense that he is carrying so much guilt, you know, that he by this by the point of the Kenobi show, he knows he's screwed up. He knows that. So some of the stuff that he did that maybe he could, he's he's really asking himself could I have done something to prevent Anakin from going down this path and so yeah getting to watch this and seeing like oh yeah here are the moments where like come on Obi-Wan like why why aren't you stepping in here more it, it just, it's all the more poignant and kind of makes me all the more excited for for what's coming yeah and what I what I like is that they don't just make it Obi-Wan is right they really do try to set up the story where like you know, Anakin makes decisions and then a lot of times they work out. I I have yet to see an episode where 
Anakin makes a decision and it doesn't work out. The closest thing I've seen is there's that other Padawan of, I think, Fisto's Padawan last season who, like, made a decision and then ended up dying for it. And it was right, General Grievous killed him. Yeah. And it made me think, like, oh, they're trying to let us know that that's something that can happen. It's like, you know, right. if you're going to always be that brash character. But so far, Annie just gets away with it everywhere he goes, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so it makes me think about, like, the Satine plot line and how that relates to Padme later and, and like how yeah. he's, he's been, he, he's been disobeying Obi-Wan and like not living up to like the way Obi-Wan did things this entire time. And now is it time for him to, when it's time for him to say no or yes to love or like yes to the Jedi order and no to love, he just makes the other decision. And, and that connection leads to what we see. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, I, I think that's such a good point, especially because to me, this is such learning this about Obi-Wan, that he did love someone at one point and that he, you know, as he said, he almost gave up the Jedi Order for her. It, to me, it, I mean, A, it's just a beautiful, romantic, sad story mm -hmm. that, that continues over the next uh, couple of seasons, to be sure. But I also just love it because the, what I take out of it, at least, is the idea that like, Part of why he never says no to Anakin is because he does still – there's a part of him that feels like he knows everything he gave up. And I think part of him regrets it maybe. Or maybe part of him is like, well, I had to do this terrible – I had to make this terrible choice. Part of me wishes I hadn't. So it's kind of like I, I, I don't feel like I can slam Anakin for doing the thing that some part of me wishes I could do. You know? Yeah, that's a great um, point. It's a great point, and I, I, I've, I've been, I probably a little over focused on the Anakin of it all, uh, because I mean these episodes, Anakin's not even heavily featured. It really is about Obi Wan and Satine, mm -hmm. and you know it's interesting. I had heard these stories are out of order. These stories are yeah. non chronological, and I never understood how they made that work or whatever. I, I'm watching it though, and but it's interesting. Like I watched episodes 12, thir 12 13, and fourteen of season two. And they're all the Duchess of Mandalore storyline, but they are clearly – there are clearly time jumps between them, and I'm guessing right. maybe they, like, fit in other stories in between them. But it's very interesting because each individual little 20-minute episode feels like a movie. Like, they do the, the intro at the beginning and then the sort mm -hmm. of postscript at the end, and it's sort of like – it feels like here's, – here's one time we inter encountered the Duchess – and here's a little later we encountered her again, you know? Right. It doesn't feel like one do, one does not pick up right where the other one left off, which is interesting because it leaves all this Star Wars negative space where you could fit other stories. And these stories could mm -hmm. fit around each other and they can have comics and they can have this or that. Um, yeah. That's 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 a neat way of doing it. And it does makes it feel more Star Wars to me because the crawl exists. It's like since last time you heard of the story this is the general shape of what's happened. And here we are. Right. Let's tell the story. You know, it's, it's always been kind of the way with, um, uh, with star Wars, which I, I kind of, yeah. I, I dig that. I like it a lot. Yeah. And like, it's nice to hear the positive. Cause I think often people slam on the out of order storytelling in clone wars, myself included. Cause I do think it causes some real problems at times, but yeah, there are some nice parts of it too. And kind of leaving that space. And <laughs> there's also some ways in which like, the you know Dave Filoni who you know is pretty close with John Favreau you know like there he he's just as much a continuity guy and very much trying to make sure that everything here fits the continuity and there's a couple things where that's really difficult you know for, so for example in the in the third movie the uh, Revenge of the Sith Anakin makes a comment about how he or Grievous makes a comment that basically indicates that him and Anakin have never met. So all through these seven seasons, there's going to be like all sorts of plot jumping through hoops just to make sure Anakin and Grievous, who are kind of two of the biggest stars of the show, are never on screen together, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> but but yeah, with episodes like this, I, I, I think I really like that. And it just – so I know you're kind of focused on Anakin, and so this may have uh, – and it's subtle uh, and picked up more – but did you pick up in these episodes a lot of the things that have been kind of now later developed in the Mandalorian TV show? Well, um, I sort of. So like I, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I'm still early on the the, the Duchess right. of Mandalore. I know there's like this this idea that Mandalore is now a peaceful planet, but mm -hmm. I, I, you know, spoiler alert, everybody. Uh, but I, 
I know that from, you know, Mandalorian, which happens, whatever, 40 years after this, the planet's gone, isn't it? Don't they talk about the how man? It's been totally devastated. It's still okay. it's still there, but like, yeah, it's been completely like there's been horrible violence, and most of the people are dead. Right. So i I knew I knew that, and watching this and right. being like, oh gosh, it's like a paradise now, or at least it's a large, mm-hmm. bustling utopia city or whatever. I'm like, okay, something. I, I'm I'm wondering if that will happen on this show, uh, right. and if I'll, I'm wondering when that will happen, and if I'll get to see it, um, yeah. for sure. So so yes, so, I I caught that, and I caught the sort of. The pushing against the idea that man, the Mandalorians, the people on this planet, are a peaceful, pacifist people, which the Duchess wants to push for. But then there's also this, what do they call them? The uh, Death Watch. Death Watch, yes. Uh, the Death right. Watch is pushing for um, them to return to their roots of being a warrior race. Right. Well, and that's that's the um, – so the connection there is – and we didn't really fully get all these pieces until – the episode of Book of Boba Fett where uh, Jin kind of goes off to be with his Mandalore people for a little while. But, you know, in this episode, they talk about how the people who didn't want Mandalore to be, like, peaceful and, and put aside their warrior ways went off to Concordia, this kind of moon, as you said, to keep alive their warrior ways. The Oh, that's right. I remember talking about that. The, the sort of offshoot of like what we've learned that Din is actually part of this. I think, I think they're called like children of the watch or something like that. I, I'm, I may be getting the name wrong, but they're, they're part of what's kind of like the, the religion that he talks about. It's basically fundamentalists. It's basically like this small offshoot of people who thought that most of Mandalore was wrong. And what we're hearing here with King Court, like the, there's the direct link that all the Mandalore stuff that's happening, uh, you know, the, the, the way that's all the people who are on Concordia. So like that, right. that's kind of the connection here. And so I, I really love that this small bit of thing that was kind of just set up as background here then gets paid off in the Mandalorian because, you know, so we're learning that Din didn't like Din didn't grow up in the world of like the Duchess. He grew up in the people who were like horribly opposed to her. Right. Also, what is it? Help me out. The years between, is it twenty years? What are we no, because I mean Darth Vader is in his what sixties or so when, um, yeah, when he so when he when the Re- Return of the Jedi ends. Yeah, so this is all taking place like the the Clone Wars is taking place around the year twenty one BBY t- before the Battle of Yavin. Okay, so, so we're talking about backwards it, years here. Right. Yeah, kind of like, you know BCE, <laughs> but so yeah, so twenty one B. Okay, so just twenty one years before the Battle of Yavin. Yeah, so 21 years before the New Hope, um, because this is about like two years before Luke is born, and Luke's about 19 when that happens. And then the TV show Mandalore is taking place about 10 years after, because, you know, the whole Galactic Civil War of the original three years, (laughs) uh, three movies, is maybe five years, and then that's taking place five years after that. So uh, by the time we get to the Mandalore and the Boba Fett TV shows— it's about 30, 31 years after what we're watching in the Clone Wars now. That makes sense. So he's so Anakin is around 50 or 60 in the, at the very end of Return of the Jedi when he takes off his mask. Makes total sense. Exactly. Um, yeah, I knew the I knew the order. It's so funny. I, I've told the story on maybe MCU cast before, but I'm not the Star Wars guy. I, I, I vociferously say that. I'm like, mostly because I don't want to... F- it's not even that I don't like Star Wars. It's that I don't want to seem like a poser because it's just not my fandom, yeah. you know? Like, so when people, especially on a podcasting, when we talk about it, I'm like, I'm always just clear that I like, it's just not my fandom. So if I'm wrong about something or whatever, I just like, it's just not my fandom at all. Not that I'm ever scared to be wrong. I'm so often wrong. I, it's very much my fandom and I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> I love to point out. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Me too. Um, when, when things are my fandom, but uh, it's so funny when Mandalorian came out, I was in the van it, just, just to like, I was in I was in the van with my um I was in the van with my band because you know like mm-hmm. we 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 take uh we we go on these road trips cuz it's always like 8 hours to the gig and so we're in the, we're in the van for 8 hours together and so we're talking about the Mandalorian in the first couple episodes and they're just like talking about it and how great it is and da, 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 and I don't I don't really like it. I'm like, "Yeah, I didn't really like the yeah. first episode. I didn't really like the first couple. It took me a while to get into it." So at that point I was like, "It's just okay. I feel like if you're not a Star Wars fan, it's just kind of like, "Hey, look, it's Star Wars." Uh, that's how I felt about Mandalorian right. at first. And then uh they were all like saying how great it was, and then they were talking about what time period it was, and they were wrong. I think they were saying it was in between the two trilogies. 
And I was like, mm. no. And they were like, what do you mean? And I was like, no, no, no. Because they say imperial credits are worth less now. And that's because the imper- empire fell. And, and I started explaining, like, just based on yeah. context clues in the episode, <laughs> why that's not true. And they were like, you're not a Star Wars fan? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay, sure, I only know things because of the way the money... Right. Like, like, that's pretty specific knowledge, but it made sense, okay? Shut up. <laughs> well, also, I mean, you were on record on the MCU cast that you are a fan, first and foremost, of, what is it, the, the deep, hot, wet continuity? Yes. That, that you really love? Yes, I do. And I feel like, I yeah, do. so, like, you love the continuity. You love knowing how all these things put together. And so mm-hmm. that's why I kind of wanted to make those connections. Oh, like, yeah. I, I double check. Yeah, it is. Jin is part of the, the – and the armorer – they're all part of the children of the watch children I, of the watch. I don't think it's been expressly said, but I think it's very clear. That's supposed to be a reference death to watch. like, yeah, death watch. That's and, so cool. And also the person who he fights with the dark saber, you know, who I, I forget, I think it, I forget what his name is, but it's something Vizsla. He's of clan Vizsla. The person who's trying to take over uh Mandalore in these episodes is pre Vizsla. He's also right. of that same Vizsla clan. So yeah, all these things. And what is the conflict that we're getting here on Mandalore is like that conflict just keeps coming up in various versions all the way through to where we are in the Mandalorian now, where 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 Jin might be wanting to take control back over Mandalore because it's the same struggle that's been happening. Yeah. I, what I find so fascinating about that, and it's really, really cool. Like, just follow that through line. It's like we look at these people in you know, the children of the watch and I, I've been watching them for years. They basically find children that are. <laughs> orphaned that need help and then they offer them a life as warriors which is you know child soldier shit it's not great and and yeah. our our titular mandalorian is a part of that um and you feel really bad for them and this this is uh, in a way you also feel you know, these guys are so cool but like there's there's definitely like some ethical problems there but then you think about it from their perspective you know if you go back 30 years their planet had this big divide between people who believed in the way and people who believed in pacifism. The pacifists seem to have won the argument and like more people democratically chose the pacifists and it led to their utter destruction. Yeah. So the watch is like, or the, and the, now the children of the watch are looking back going like, no, we know what the other way leads to. Like we are children mm-hmm. of the watch. We are children of the way, you know? I think right. that's uh, – it's it's really sad, and it's just sort of like the cycle of war, you know, the cycle oh, yeah. of watching people – peaceful people being destroyed, uh, you know, destroyed by uh, despots and, and, and mm-hmm. then their children needing to feel – this warrior sensibility. Yeah. Like finding war sensibility or like looking to, they like often looking towards extreme religion as a way of kind of like explaining what happened. Like, you know, that we, we fell away from the way. And so we were punished or just like, it becomes a sort of identity. You know, like I, one of the areas of history that I really studied is, is Ireland and all that. And how you Mm -hmm. look at how like one of the, it's changing now, but one of the reasons why Ireland was one of the most sort of conservative Catholic countries for a long time is very connected to the fact that the English basically tried to outlaw Catholicism in Ireland in the 1800s. And mm-hmm. So it became, and so, you know, be, fighting the English and Catholicism all became wrapped up together. And that happens in so many parts of the world. Um, you know, you can see it now with like the Christian fundamentalist violence and, and, and things like that. And yeah, and so it, it, to me with a Mandalorian, it's been so fun like watching this, like a character who at first you think is just kind of like generic Mandalorian guy. And they're like, no, he's, they're kind of more and more showing what a fringe offshoot he's part of. And the other thing that came to mind, though, as we were saying that is I never really put this together in, the, in quite this way until you said it about how what the way is doing is, you know, they're like finding these children like the foundlings and kind of turning them into child, children soldiers. That sounds an awful lot like what the Jedi do. Yeah. And, you know, part of the whole problem is that in theory, the idea is that if you find a child young enough they won't ever remember their parents, so they don't miss their parents. They won't ever know other human connections. And the problem with Anakin is, as Yoda said, he's too old. He's too old to be indoctrinated as a child soldier. Mm. Like, so yeah, they just it, I, I never really put all that together. But wow. it's such an interesting thing happening. Yeah, there. no, that's a that's a great point. And you, you look at the Jedi, and yeah, they're supposed to be peacekeepers. 
or whatever. Uh-huh. But like that, that, and that's a huge through line. And I, I, I keep wanting to get back to it because I keep wanting to focus on the Anakin of all and the Mandalorian of it all is also incredibly fascinating. But these episodes are really about Satine and Obi Wan and their differences. And right. Obi Wan is also on the side of the Death Watch in a way that he is. He believes that like. The violence is necessary. He he, right. he 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 calls himself a peacekeeper, but he uses a lot of violence for a peacekeeper. Is something that Satine says mm-hmm. to him. Um, yeah. And there's best moment in this entire season two. All all the parts that I watched anyway was when uh, I forget his name, but one one <laughs> because I didn't know anyone's name, but uh, sort of the villain of this. There's there's an episode called like the Voyage of the Duchess or something like that. Oh, the- uh, Voyage of, Voyage of Temptation. That's it. Voyage of Temptation. Best episode I've seen yet of the show. And it ends, uh, you know, she is purely a pacifist. She believes in, in pacifism. She'll defend herself if she has to, but she's a pacifist. She's not going to hurt anyone. She doesn't want to kill anyone. And Obi-Wan clearly loves her. Early, like it, it, on some level, he wants her to think well of him, if nothing else. And there's just yeah. a moment where a villain stands before them and says, oh, what are you going to do? You're a pacifist. Right. So yeah, strike me down and ru- and ruin your entire pledge of pacifism or you go ahead, strike me down and like, you know, prove the violent man you are to this woman that you love. And then he says, who will strike first and brand themselves a cold blooded killer. And then just a lightsaber comes from the back of him through his <laughs> chest and Anakin standing behind him and says, he was going to blow up the ship. <laughs> like, it's just yeah. it's just so perfect. It's such a great encapsulation of the entire argument between the three of them, really. Um, so good. It's so good, especially because I don't, I don't know if you caught this. There's just a few bars of the dark side, like, dun, 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 dun. Like nice. The Darth Vader I didn't catch it. That's that great. Happens. Yeah. It's just, it's so... Because it's everything. It it shows Obi Wan and the struggle he's having, where he like to me. There's, I could this kind of what you're saying. There's kind of a hypocrisy that Obi Wan has. Oh, for sure. And part of Anakin's thing is that it's hard to raise someone when you're a hypocrite. And and so Anakin's like, well, yeah, isn't this what you're supposed to do? Isn't this what I'm killing the person? Mm -hmm. And it's just so tragic. But also in that moment, it's kind of exactly what's needed. But you're also just like, oh, yeah, I that that's probably one of my top five moments of all of Clone Wars. You know, Mm -hmm. just. It, you're right, it captures everything so well about, oh, and kind of how Obi-Wan is really caught in his feelings for Satine and, and who he's now trying to be in raising Anakin. What's so interesting, and, and I can't wait to see them explore it on Obi-Wan, is the I, the way that they make Anakin make so much sense so much of the time. Yeah. Because, you know, Anakin is, in that moment, he, say, he, he, he kills him, and it's just this very practical, he was going to blow up the ship, like... You know, it just doesn't matter what you think yeah. about ethics or you can bounce this around all day and sit there and stand there. But like he was going to blow up the ship. It's self-defense. I killed the guy. No big deal. Um, and the again, part of the reason Obi-Wan doesn't, you know, reprimand him for that is because he's right. And Obi-Wan knows yeah. he's right. But it also leads to the dark side. It's like practicality without any kind of rules, without any kind of system of belief or ethics leads to destruction as well. And it's, it's just, it's just fascinating to me knowing that this is Darth Mm -hmm. Vader that we're looking Mm -hmm. at the, you know, the baddest MF in the galaxy, you know, like just come, come and come in later to destroy everyone and be so the epitome of evil. I mean, he is like, he is the epitome of evil for those first three movies it's like that guy is they're constantly sort of proving him right and the storylines constantly prove him right and obi-wan doesn't stand up to him because he knows uh who he he knows he's right Mm -hmm. in so many cases there's one another case that i think is particularly interesting uh where uh, before you get into that i want to think about what you said about because i love what you said about the kind of practicality with no rules leads to trouble and i think part of the point is that when you have rules that have no practicality to them, yeah, you know, it, it's a very strong but very brittle system. And so, sure. and and I think what the whole Anakin story is when he finds situations that don't fit those rules, because they give him no framework for them, 
all he can do is throw out the rules entirely. Absolutely. You know, and like this is it's funny if you read things about like ex Mormons and other folks who come. I mean, you you might even talk about this. Like when you come out of a very rigid religious, everything is black and white, everything is clear, and you get rid of that. There's sort of a sense of like, okay, but what now? You know what? And and I think that's to me so much of the tragedy of Anakin is that he was never he was told either follow all these rules or it's nothing, and so it became nothing. He was never given a framework for how to balance the the ideal yeah. and the practical and Absolutely. Find, find the middle ground. Well, and that's the thing. The thing about rules is sometimes they're not practical. And like, that's the thing with, when you go back to Star Trek, it's like the, the idea of sometimes they make the decision that doesn't seem practical because it fits their framework of the Federation or whatever, you know, it's right. like the Federation ideal is more important than the practical thing. And the prime directive is that yeah, all over the place. All over. Um, and so it's the same sort of uh, same, definitely the same sort of question. Um, and I like that a lot. I like that a whole lot. Um, to get to get into what I was getting to, a saying go this. There's this um, episode earlier in the season where there's some sort of mind control monster creating zombies. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. the episode I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, there's there's like a there's some sort of evil mind control lady hung up in this uh, cave causing all these zombies to, and she has these worms that if they get in your body, they'll, uh, they'll, and, and there's a Jedi, I forget her name as well. Uh, the, it's the lady green lady, Luminara. Luminara. Okay. Sorry guys. I think it's, I think it's Luminara. <laughs> She's in a lot of the, she was in a lot of season yeah. one as well. Um, but Luminara is, is hung up by her hands and, uh, they're about to put one of these worms in her and Anakin's ready to fight, you know, uh, and ready to stop the worm from getting Luminara and Obi-Wan, which I guess I never understood that he was a scientist exactly, but he's going like, wait, we need to watch this. We need to understand yeah. <laughs> how this works. And he's literally telling Anakin, don't fight yet. I want to see if this worm goes in through the nose or the ear because I need to understand it better. And it's, it's not something I've heard that much of, but it's, it's, it's definitely that same struggle between like, I want to do this. Uh, I want to do this in this very logical, non-passionate way. And, and, and Anakin just sees it as uncaring. Um, yeah. and, and you know, they end up fighting and then at the end, <laughs> Obi-Wan has the worm in his hand and Anakin slaps it out of his hands and crushes it on his, on his boot. And he's like, I was going to study that. And, and Anakin says, study my boot. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's another, um, a really, I think important moment for me watching the show, because it was a moment that Obi-Wan was clearly wrong. Like there's just no way you let these zombies get closer to your friend with the uh, brain worm. Like, that's just not a thing you should do. That's clearly the right. And it's not even like that's a Jedi decision. It was just him being weirdly obstinate and like analytical over, caring for people. And, and so yeah. Obi-Wan, I think is just in the wrong there and they don't even, the show doesn't really treat it that way necessarily, but Anakin clearly does. See, I guess I, I think I see Obi-Wan's point and granted, I did not, I read the summary, but I did not read the, I did not watch the episode again. I watched it probably six months ago last time. Um, but cause my memory of it is my understanding, especially from reading more about it is that it, it's this idea of like, are you fighting for individual – are you protecting individual people or are you protecting, like, humanity or, you know, sentience? Because my understanding, at least, was that what Obi-Wan felt was that by better understanding this, they could then sort of, like, fight – you know, they could, like, stop – they could, like, unzombify people in general and they could, like, prevent the zombification mm. in general. And so it was a kind of, like, you know, you can save this person right here, right now – but by doing that, you you now have no more ability to save all the billions or millions of people who are being affected by this. And, like, I think in that overall calculus, I do think Anakin is, is more correct. But I but I think that's kind of the point, is that Obi-Wan, like, I, I think it was my, my podcast partner, Paul, who, who I described this way. And he was like, yeah, that, that fits quite well. But I'm not sure. It might be someone else. But, like, there could be this attitude of, like, sort of you love humanity, but you hate individual humans. Um, where, <laughs> and, and I don't think it's even hate. But I think the Jedi have this kind of very, like, into, it, it's kind of like a Vulcan almost. Where, like, Vulcans, Vulcans, like, have a 
logical sense that like genocide is bad and that saving people's lives is good. Right. It's a cold kind of... calculus instead of yeah. passion or caring for people. Yeah. Like to me, there's something very Vulcan about the Jedi in that they're very like saving, learning, gaining more scientific knowledge is good, especially when it's scientific knowledge about something that is very harmful. But he doesn't have the like, no, oh my God, my friend, I must save her right now. And that's, like, I I'm not defending him, but I think it, it's a really interesting part of his character that's revealed through that. Right. And that, it, that's part of where Anakin, like, Anakin can't do that. Anakin can't, you know, and and the funny thing is, like, neither could Luke. You know, you, you remember sure. back to in, in Empire Strikes Back when Yoda says, you know, look, if you, if you honor what Han and Leia fight for, you have to let them die, possibly. And it turns out Yoda's wrong. That's the whole point. But that, I think that's very much the Jedi philosophy. Right. Which I guess this is part of what, you know, I, and I've heard, I've heard people say this for years about the mm -hmm. idea that the Jedi are often just wrong. Yeah. From the movies, you just kind of, I don't think you really get that as much. It seems like, yeah. it seems more like Luke is Luke is maybe I, I mean, in that case, I guess that's the that's the case in the original trilogy. That is mm -hmm. the one big case you can make is is Luke wrong for leaving his training? Um, clearly, the effects of him saving his friends is worth it. Um, but what you know, what would have happened if he had stayed and trained? I, you know, it's right. I, I don't know. Um, and it, it's I don't I guess I haven't heard that case as much made in the bigger you know, these tentpole movies, the Jedi, it, it just seen, and I've, I've said it before and I'll say here, this very offensive thing on the, uh, on the star Wars universe podcast. Uh, <laughs> but like the reason I haven't liked star Wars as much as I like other, other, other media is cause like, I just, it feels like the good guys and bad guys are just color coded. It's yeah. like, you know, it's just the red swords are bad, you know? And, and, right. the, and, and generally, I mean, even with like, and that's why I was interested to watch the show. And that's why we're doing this whole rewatched or watch together, mm -hmm. because to me, it's always seemed that Anakin is a, is a man who is a, he's a boy. He's like, just wants good, good things. He falls in love and then a switch flips, you know, and he is willing to do anything he, to save his beloved. He is willing to do anything, including killing a lot of children. Um, yeah. And then in the end, he's not willing to kill his own children. So he's sort of that same switch just sort of flips back and he saves his kids and he saves right. his son. Um, and it's sort of like this sort of like you're 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 good until you're evil and you're evil until you're good. You know, like it's just like yeah. that's that's the way I've always seen it. So that's why I'm particularly interested in this, because this is the story of how Anakin gets there. Um, and I think it's probably one of the most important stories to tell of the Star Wars canon that, like, really gets you into a headspace where you can understand. I mean, and these days, there's definitely a lot more moral grayness happening in mm -hmm. in Star Wars. I mean, with the Mandalorian and Boba Fett, yeah. they're, you know, these are, they're, they're showing the scum and villainy and how those people are people, too. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how they kind of justify... And I know every everyone I've talked to for years loves the way that Filoni justifies the sort of descent mm -hmm. of um, of, Anakin. of Anakin, and and, and I like yeah. just really excited to see it. No, I, I'm so glad to see that hear that, and I think in some ways, cause remember the first time you were like, "Oh, Star Wars, it's just you know, good guys and bad guys, and there's no subtlety." I was like, "What are you talking about?" But I realized, like, I do think some of that subtlety is there in the movies, but it's very it's very much subtext. Right. And it's very easy. And and I think there is a lot of like fan projection. And these shows, I think, is really where it comes out a lot more, you know, and it's like uh, to me, you talk about how like none of the big tentpole movies have really gone into that idea of like the failure of the Jedi. I think there's one that has the last Jedi. Yeah. And I think it's part of why it's so controversial, because some people love it and some people hate it because they don't want that. You but. Know? I agree with you that that movie does. That's why it's one of my favorites and people hate it, but I, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. But the guy who's saying that is the bad guy with the red sword. So it comes off at the end of the movie feeling like, you know, Ray got the books and she's protecting the Jedi order 
and the bad guy with the red sword was defeated and his ideology is defeated. You know what I mean? That's how that movie ends. Well, it, it's also Luke saying it, though. But yeah, I, I that's get what true. You're that's too. true. But it's well, see, here's the thing. Though. It's Luke saying it until Luke finally decides, OK, I'll come out of this hiding place I've been like. It's Luke yeah, saying I, it until the end where he's like, I'm going to go be my hero Jedi again. To, to me, to me, Last Jedi is supposed to be part one. I mean, it's part two, but like, it, and this is a whole other story, but I feel like it's why I'm so mad about the last movie, because I feel like it, you're right, so much of The Last Jedi is starting a conversation that then needs the next couple sentences, and then uh, J.J. was like, ah, screw that, let's just do something else. I agree. Um, the one thing I'll say about that, though, that I really love about these episodes, I'm kind of wondering how you, how you saw, because it, again, it's not the most subtle by any means. But again, in that, you know, is Star Wars just good guys versus bad guys? I really like that the core of this, a lot of the season, but especially this, that three episode arc is about the people who don't want to fight in the, who don't think that the, you know, clone wars are the good, the good Republic versus the bad separatists. Then are yeah. asking real questions because like, it, it was funny. The first time I watched the clone wars movies that, that the prequels, I was like, you never tell us why the separatists are so bad. This is dumb. Until I realized that was kind of the point. Was the point was that it actually wasn't as clear. But I feel like this show is going into that much more so in yeah. a way the movies never did. Well, see, I think that's that's beautiful. And I love that. And I'm so excited to watch it. But I just, as you said, I don't get that from the text of the movies themselves. And so that's why yeah. this is, you know, that's why this is so important. And I just really hope that we get more Star Wars movies that have that grayness in them. And I've, you know, I've been, I've been hearing other people who care more than I do saying that for years, like where are the gray Jedi? And, you know, like right. the, like the, the, the sort of idea that they understand the difference there, there's this duality to the force and it's not all about one way or it's not all about passion. Uh, right. And it's not all about passion. Like it is with the dark side. And it's not all about analytical, like whatever, making good choices, but avoiding human connection on the, you know, the Jedi side, you know, it's about finding a balance and like, it's, yeah. it's literally in the text, bring balance to the force, you know, like that's the whole thing. Yeah. But it like, I've always found that fast, a fascinating phrase in the original, you know, in that, uh, the first, whatever the first prequel, uh, yeah. <laughs> they, um, the, the I, Phantom Menace. Yeah. Phantom Menace, the, the bring balance, he'll, he'll bring balance to the force. Cause the funny thing is he does, but it's yeah. like, you know, you've got, all these Jedi that are sort of like ruling the, uh, you know, ruling the nations or whatever. Like they're, they're these mm -hmm. peacekeepers. Then you have this, you have this guy rise. Who's like all passion and no like ethics, no analytics. Mm -hmm. And they just like, and there's a balance. It's just not, not what you were hoping. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that pro pro prophecy did not work out the way you were hoping it would. Yeah. And I think part of that is why, I don't know if the movies are ever going to get to this level of, of greatness. I really hope they do. But I, I think there may be a fence within Disney of like, we're going to keep the movies mostly about the big lightsaber fights and the starship battles. And especially it, it's part of why all the controversy about last Jedi makes me so sad is because I think that, that especially with, with the movie that came after it, there was kind of like, no, nah, okay, no, we're, we're going to save that for the TV shows. Exactly. But I think it's also yeah. part of why I'm so excited that things like, like in the Mandalorian, that they're so very clearly, making the, they're making the direct ties to the Clone Wars TV shows and to some of that other media. Because to me, at least, it's Filoni and the others saying that at least on Disney Plus with the TV shows, all that complexity, all that nuance that was only in, in the cartoons, that's where we're going to live. We're going to live in that subtlety and nuance, not just the laser swords and space battles, which could be great too, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. But. It can be, but it only, yeah. to me, it's only great when it has the context of a true emotional moment that you can understand. And, and that's, right. that's when those, ma that's when those battles matter. And like, yeah, I, I freaking love the last Jedi. Those, those like the arguments that he makes against the Jedi and like against just, oh, just yeah. I am a big believer in just destroying the past. <laughs> mm -hmm. I am. I'm a big believer in like, you are not ruled by who your parents are. You are not ruled by, yeah. I love the reveal that, you know, 
that she's no one. That is such a beautiful, great reveal. It's so good. It's so freaking it's so good. good. And then they really do undo everything. <laughs> it's just like everything well, I love about Last Jedi gets undone, and I, I hate it. Well, it, it, as, at some point, I want if you're comfortable doing this, because a lot of this might be like, you know, Matt Carroll's childhood therapy. Um, but <laughs> I, to me, one of the things I love Last Jedi so much is how much it is the Jedi is a metaphor for the worst parts of organized religion. Yeah. You know, because there's one line where Luke says where they had the arrogance to think that they that they had sole ownership over the force, you know, and, and that to me that's often is kind of like, you know, you have to come to this building at this time mm -hmm. on this day and say these words uh, for God to care, you know. Right, um, yeah. I'm going to go a little bit off on a tangent here, but I think it's very relevant. A couple of weeks ago now, um, there was a story, I don't know if you heard this, but where some Catholic priest was baptizing people but wasn't using the exact right words. Yeah, I did hear about that. He was saying, like, <sighs> we do this instead of I do this or something yeah. like that. He said, I think so he now, said I instead of we. Yeah. According to church law, there's like hundreds of people who are now officially not baptized. <laughs> and it's so just like, <sighs> why would you think some divine being would care? Yeah. And to me, that's very much the Jedi, this idea of like, no, Anakin, you have to do it exactly this way or you're not, the force won't accept you. And yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're all seeing all this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And it's, well, see, that's the thing though. And he sees it. He sees these other, these dark side beings through this entire series using the force. It's not that the force won't yeah. accept him, you know, like it's just that Palpatine eventually gets that opportunity to convince him that like, there's more to the force than just yeah. than just the Jedi Order, um, and and when he sees you know the person that he loves in danger, like mm -hmm. I, I'm excited to see see more of this. I, I am. I'm, yeah. It's it's. I think it's going to be really good. I'm. I've heard nothing but good things for years, and I also, cool. given the context of this, I'm excited to go back and watch the, particularly the episode two and three. Yeah. Well, and that makes me really happy because I'm sure you've had this too, where like, you know, I'm sure anytime you, you've shown Star Trek The Next Generation to someone and you really want them to like it and then you're going through some of that dreck in season one. Sure, and you're yeah. Like, I, I hope they don't hate it. So, uh, you know, and of course, totally fine, whatever you want it thinking about Star Wars. Sure. But I'm really happy hearing that you're now starting to see some of the stuff we've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, this is that that moment in the ship that uh, on, on that, that uh, uh, Voyage of Temptation yeah. is – one of the best Star Wars moments I've ever seen. Like, just yeah. down, hands down. Um, I think so. There's a lot of fun stuff in Star Wars. I, I've, I've, as I've said in the past, I've seen everything. As I've grown up watching all the movies and everything. Uh, I mm -hmm. just, you know, there, there are very few of those moments that I see something happen and I'm like, oh, he just, with his laser sword, made a point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like... And and that laser sword coming through the back of that bad guy and him saying he was going to blow up the ship is like the point of this entire season. And he literally stabs him in the back. Yes. He does like the most dishonorable thing. Yes. You know? Like but straight through the heart. You see the laser sword. And, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that they play the Empire theme there because mm -hmm. as soon as the sword protruded through his chest, I was like, of course, it's Anakin. Like I like I knew immediately who it was, and I wonder if that musical cue was got in my brain or not. Like I, I it's it's really that that's fun, mm, or or that's or, or was just the because he wasn't in that episode much. He was very much in the background. Yeah. He'd been captured or something, and then like mm -hmm. you you know it's all about Satine and Obi Wan, and then suddenly just stabbed through the stab through, and it's like oh it's Anakin. Yeah. I wonder if that uh that musical cue was in my brain even though I didn't hear it. Oh yeah, that's fair, and it's a lot. I think it's only like three or four bars. It's very or, or three or four notes. You know, that's, very love it. Or, the only thing I was gonna say about that, and just kind of tying it back to where where your heart lies, I know, although also mine. When I watch that scene where where Anakin does that, part of what I hear in my head is Frank Castle telling Matt Murdock, you know, when you beat the guys up, they they get back. When you knock 100%, them down, they get back up. Yeah. When I knock them down, they stay down. Because 100%. I feel like to to me, Frank Castle and Anakin Skywalker would be best friends you know they, like, they really have that same idea yeah. of like why are you letting these rules hold you back just do the thing kill the bad guys and and we had some great conversations at the punisher season two because i kind of see it as frank castle started just 
being pulled to the dark side. You know, it's that mm-hmm. same kind of idea of where he, cause he is so, I think lost in the practicality. He doesn't have the rules anymore. So, yeah. And that's, I, I look forward to seeing, I would love for them to make, and maybe they will after Obi-Wan. I could absolutely see this, especially if people really, uh, accept Hayden Christensen as, as mm-hmm. Vader. I could totally see them making a Vader show. I can see that. Or, or movie. Uh, and, and, and I, I definitely hear, I immediately hear people sound like, no, we need less Vader. We need him to be important when he shows up, all that stuff. I, I've, yeah. I've heard those arguments, but I think like really a look under the mask of what was going on, what's really going through his head during all those mm-hmm. moments when he's doing the big evil things. Uh, if we saw really like inside the head of someone who's about to destroy, you know, Leia's homeworld or whatever, um, mm-hmm. like that, that would be really powerful. I think like to, to, to see the, there's even humanity there. Like there's even a logic there. He really thinks he's doing what mm-hmm. is at least right by what he wants to happen or like his passions or what, whatever the dark side is. Cause I do think like even wa- watching this show, they're, they're going for all this grayness with Anakin and, and Obi-Wan, but like you still have just the mustache twirliest mustache twirlers, like as the bad guys, you know what I mean? Like all, all the, all the Sith on this show are like, I'm here to cause war and chaos, you know, and like literally using like old timey villain kind of like, I'm, I'm going to kill the bad guy. I'm going to kill all you good guys. You do gooders. Like, it just feels very, it still feels very mustache twirly when you turn, when you get to the Sith. And I'd like to see an exploration of what the Sith. Yeah. What's going on in their heads? You know, like who, who are, who are you? <laughs> and I'll say, um, uh, obviously I would love to see it on screen. There have been a couple of great novels that have explored exactly that. Right. Um, I've heard the of that. second book in the Thrawn novels is all about kind of Thrawn spending time with like flashbacks when he, he went on a mission with Anakin and then later he's, he's going on a mission with Vader. And a lot of it is Vader's internal monologue throughout the book. Huh, that's cool. Uh, and then there's also a book called Lords of the Sith, which is not the best book by any means, but it's about, um, Anakin Vader, like Vader and Palpatine doing something together while like it's pretty early in him becoming Vader and like the last vestiges of Anakin are still like fighting in his mind. And so, yeah, both of those are, I think, really good books for for that kind of story. And so, yeah, I think I think like there's a part of me that feels like like, you know, it's kind of like uh, in the movie, the first movie Alien is much scarier than any of the rest because you almost never see the alien. And I, I'm a big believer that I think, you know, if you show me just a little bit of something and let my imagination fill in the rest, that's always going to be so much better than actually showing it to me. Mm-hmm. And so do you kind of feel like the more times I see Anakin, uh, the more times I see Vader force choke some poor person, the less effective it becomes? Yeah. But yeah, I would love to hear more of that. And I... if But if they could... If we can get more of that in this show, I would love that. You, you know when you see a movie that is about you see a movie that's about a villain and a hero, whatever, you know, classic story. But then you see those real, like these days it's in the, it's generally in the, in the vein of like indie films, but you see like Mm -hmm. something from the perspective of a killer, like, um, Oh man, I'm going to space on, I mean, in daredevil, Oh, in daredevil, we see so much from Wilson Fisk's perspective. Yeah, for sure. Like, right. Like take that. I think it's like the third or fifth, maybe the fifth or sixth episode of Daredevil. That's really Fisk's backstory. And it ends with him, I believe, doing like a horrible, horrible action. Um, or you see him do multiple horrible, horrible actions. And the terror is no less terrifying. It's actually kind of more terrifying because you see right. why he's doing it. And you're like, I get where he's coming from, but I'm still not comfortable with him crushing that guy's head. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just not it's it's. I would love to see a Vader exploration that like really got into the mind of Vader and showed oh, yeah. him doing some of his classic, you know, Vader smash him ups. But it's like. You're watching it and there's this visceral like, ooh, I understand why he cut that guy in half. And I don't like that I understand that, you know, I'd love yeah. to see that. I mean, in the books, one thing they go into is that he has just this feeling, this constant rage in part because of regret. You know, that there's a part of him that like hates the emperor. with the, And so part like and, and Paul, my, my often co-host, pointed this out that if you watch Empire Strikes Back, 
part of why Vader is going so off the deep end there and killing so many people is because he he has to obey his master. But but he's kind of lying. He lies to the Emperor a couple of times about wanting to reach out to find Luke. And I think there's so much of the conflict there. And there's there's one moment from the original movie. It's a two second shot. I don't think this was intentional at all, especially because they didn't know what they were going to do with Leia and Vader at that point. Maybe they did. And maybe it was just a weird acting moment, but I, th- I I think this one shot you could turn into such a great moment of what you're talking about. They're about to ki- they're about to blow up Alderaan, Leia's planet, and you know Tark is the one doing it. Vader never says let's do it; he just stands there passively. And Leia like rushes forward like to attack Tarkin, saying no, don't do it. And Vader puts his hand on her shoulder and pulls her back to him. And I remember watching it and thinking like. Knowing what I do, that Vader is her father, there's almost a little tiny bit of a, like, you're about to go through this very hard moment. I want to keep you safe. I want to mm. not have you go attack Tarkin. I don't think that's intent. I don't know if that was intentional when they made it in the slightest. But I would just love, since I think you can have that reading watching that moment, I'd love, yeah, I'd love to hear his internal monologue. Mm-hmm. What is there some tiny part of him that feels a connection to Leia that he doesn't, that he won't let himself understand or just a basic compassion moment towards towards her in that moment. Yeah, um, I love that. That that it's like the two percent of Anakin that's in his brain and ninety eight percent of Vader is shutting it down. But yeah, that'd be great to get. And, yeah, yeah. I love that. I, I've always considered the uh Vader turn at the end of Return of the Jedi, uh, once we kinda got the whole story, it's like his going full on evil for mm-hmm. for the those three films is basically um, him having, sorry, <laughs> him having lost everything in Padme and then losing the children, like literally. Yeah. Um, and then he's just like, it's almost like he's gone too far. It's like this sunk cost fallacy for Vader mm-hmm. where he's like, I've chosen my path. It cost me everything. It didn't, I right. got nothing out of it. I've chosen my path though. I've lost my mentor. I've lost, I've lost respect of everyone. The only thing I have is this path. And then the end, he finally realizes like this little piece of my family survived. And like this little piece of me and Padme survived and I can turn around and save this little piece of Anakin that's left, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, yeah, not, thank, so much here we can go and do. Yeah, um, for sure. I think we, 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 we thought this was going to be short, like 20, 30 minutes. We're now almost at an hour. Dang. Um, okay. Yep. But yeah. I'm just, I, I'm just love this, Matt. I'm so glad you're, you're really getting into the show. I think we have so much fun discussing this over the next couple of seasons. Absolutely. And part of it, part of the reason we go so long is like, <laughs> we I've, I've got these very little bitty things to say about Clone Wars, but me and you haven't really dug deep into Star Wars. Like just like the overall. Yeah. So we keep going into these, like what we think philosophically about the bigger Star Wars universe. And it's, yeah. it's a lot of fun. Exactly. So thanks for, thanks for having so, me, man. My pleasure. Well, um, uh, Matt, I've heard you do one or two other podcasts in your spare time. Oh, Where yeah. Oh, yeah. Yourself? You know, uh, all the places. Straight at Panda dot com. That's all the, all the podcasts I do are on there. Uh, but, you know, Star Wars, uh, Star Trek Universe podcast, Marvel Cinematic Universe podcast. Uh, we do those are kind of two of the weekly ones Then Pandavision and Bingers Assemble. Um, so, yeah, check out all those shows. We do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I know, uh, speaking of uh, the uh, Star Wars connection, Oscar Isaac, who uh, Star Wars fans know as Poe, will soon be starring in uh, Moon Knight coming out on uh, Disney Plus from Marvel. Mm-hmm. And he'll be covering that for the MCU. Really excited for that. So, yeah, check out all the great podcasts on strandedpanda.com. Uh, you'll also find, if you go to the ethicalpanda.com, my kind of subset of stuff, um, obviously re- relating to the Stranded Panda name. Uh, that's where you'll find all my podcasts, the, the Superhero Ethics podcasts, uh, other Star Wars episodes. There you also find all the ways to contact us. Let us know what you think. What do you, uh, what's kind of your feeling about uh, this Clone Wars stuff as we get closer to the Kenobi show? How do you feel about the the great romance that didn't happen of Obi-Wan and Satine? Uh, this is, I believe, the most written about in terms of fanfic romance. And it is like so many people have done so much with kind of the alternate versions of like what if Obi-Wan and Satine could have been together. So would love to, you know, hear your thoughts on that. You can find all of that on theethicalpanda.com. So on behalf of myself, Matt, thank you all so much for listening. Matt, thanks for being our guest. And to all of you, have a good day.